afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad to join you all. Uh, so today we're going to study a little bit about disaster case management. This is going to be kind of a high level overview. And then we're going to talk about long term recovery groups because they are critical for recovery uh, after disasters. So uh, kind of an overview of what the training today. Uh, we're going to look at case management. We're going to look at state VOAD. Julia talked a little bit about that. We're going to talk about national VOAD because those are all very important in the recovery process. We're going to look at long-term recovery groups. And I'm putting these terms up because for some of you, they may be new terms. We tend to, in the disaster world, use a lot of acronyms. Uh, so please put in the chat and Julia can help, both Julia's. Uh, if I use, I'll try not to use acronyms, but we're going to also look at community capacity and resiliency. Uh, FEMA is not the only partner in this. They're a major partner in a federally declared disaster, but it takes all of these organizations working together. And then we're going to do a case study where you can actually work through and see why it is so important to have a long-term recovery group. So this presentation uh, is just not my individual knowledge. Uh, this is knowledge that we put together over the years. As uh, Julia said, we're a national leader in disaster case management where we do federal programs, we do state programs, we do local programs. Uh, it also, the materials from National VOAD has a workshop called uh, National VOAD Recovery Tools. And we have a long-term recovery committee at National VOAD. I'm the vice chair of National VOAD, and we work with states to provide training to state VOADs on how recovery works and how to put together long-term recovery committees and groups. Church Rural Services, which is a National VOAD partner, uh, some of this information is taken from their previous recovery presentations, and then also the North Carolina Department of Emergency Management and FEMA. A little bit about us. Uh, we're a very old organization. Uh, we've been around over 175 years. We actually worked and provided uh, emotional and spiritual care and some, we didn't call it that in those days, but during the American Civil War, we provided support to families. We're a founding member of the National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster. St. Vincent de Paul is primarily a voluntary organization, although we have staff but we were divided into eight regions. And my organization has a disaster operations committee. And we have volunteers across the nation that serve on that committee and they cover all the eight regions. Your state, Pennsylvania, is in our Eastern region. And uh, Anthony Placino, who couldn't be with us today, is the chair of the Eastern region. So we coordinate when a disaster hits with all the St. Vincent de Paul chapters, which we call councils in your state. I only cover uh, the United States branch uh, and American territories, and we have an international branch that covers the rest of the world that's located in Paris. So today we're going to talk about disaster case management, and many of you may be uh, in social services or human services. This is a little bit different uh, because this is a time-limited process. We're only going to be dealing with the disaster-affected individual and that's very difficult. I know it's difficult for a lot of my staff when we get into these programs. If we have other social services or mental health or behavioral health issues, we refer those out to organizations that are trained to do that, that have the insurance have coverage to do that. Our goal is just to work with the disaster survivor on the disaster impacted goals and to help them on their road to recovery. So if you all could put on mute, if you're not speaking, that would help. I'm getting feedback. Thank you. So each organization decides, uh, you know, what they want their disaster case managers to do. Uh, different organizations, uh, the, the case manager may be involved in aspects other than just case management. They may help on, for example, the construction cost analyst. Sometimes that's part of disaster case management. They may have an individual on their team assigned to that. But the main goal of the case manager is to work with the survivor uh, to identify what their needs are, uh, to help them on the road to recovery by developing what we call a recovery plan. And it's a roadmap to help that individual determine what are they going to do in the next 30 days? What are they going to do in two months? 
in six months, in a year. We just finished up a program for Hurricane Harvey in Texas in December, and it took that long. Uh, and we still have about 17 open cases that we're working with. Um, so it, it's a long process. Uh, we worked with over 5,000 cases there, and it's a very long process to, on the road to recovery. I know in Hurricane Katrina, it was almost a decade that we worked with survivors. So that's why it's important to try to look at what type of systems are in place in your community, because you have some individuals that are going to be able to recover in 30 days and others it may take years. And as I mentioned, the qualifications are determined by the voluntary organization, and it depends on the type of case management uh, that is being done. So why is it important for survivors recovery? Why do we always talk about disaster case management? Well, we're looking at individuals that are in different situations. Uh, we're talking about families living in generational poverty. Uh, these are families that uh, when a disaster hits, they're even more vulnerable uh, because they have multiple needs. We also find many middle income families fall into what we call situational poverty. And I'll give an example of that. Uh, maybe they paid their homeowner's insurance their entire life, but they didn't read uh, the, the riders and some of the things that changed on their homeowner's policy. And because of that, they weren't eligible. Or maybe uh, they didn't have flood insurance. And again, they didn't review all the different requirements in their community, or maybe it's state law changed. So it's interesting when we see people in the situation uh, because many times they have a very difficult time recovering because they've never been in that situation their entire lives. And then we look at people with uh, functional and special needs. These are very vulnerable populations. We can't assume that they're gonna call our agency hotline or 211. We may have to walk out into the community to try to identify these individuals. And then we have people with cultural and language barriers. Believe it or not, in this day and age, there's many people who can't access the internet or people that don't have smartphones. So I think a lot of times we make assumptions as organizations uh, that we can put information out there and that people are gonna contact us and they'll be able to get access uh, to services, but that's not always the case. And that's why disaster case management is so critical because we can be an advocate for all these types of organizations and groups. So let's look at different types of disaster case management. So you can have programs that are 100% voluntary. We have done that. Uh, St. Vincent de Paul does that across the country uh, where we have our councils that will be working with individuals. And those are usually in smaller or non-federally declared disasters. It's very difficult uh, to ask volunteers to stay on board and work cases for a year or two years or three years. But we have done uh, disasters where we've worked with volunteers for 30 or 60 days, uh, where we maybe had a flooding situation or sadly a domestic terrorism situation and, and they were able to be there and do some initial case management. There's also programs that are funded by foundations or non-governmental organizations. We've done this with the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. Uh, we worked in uh, in Nebraska, we worked the DeWitt floods and the Center for Disaster Philanthropy funded that program. We've also funded it ourselves uh, in different parts of the country in California for wildfires. So you can do organizational disaster case management. But again, if you're talking about a large scale disaster like a Hurricane Maria, a Harvey, an Ida, it's very difficult for a foundation or even a local organization to fund that. And then some states have set aside dollars where they have a state funded program. And so when a disaster hits, then they can roll out that state funded program and they work with their state VOAD. They may have uh, a sole source procurement where they have VOAD members that are assigned to do that. Uh, some states also have programs where maybe state employees uh, work the program. So you see a variety of these type of programs, uh, just depending upon uh, the appropriated dollars in the state. Probably uh, the one that most people know about are the programs funded by FEMA. And FEMA has done this for a number of years. 
after Katrina, there were a number of revisions in legislation on how FEMA funded disaster case management. I have been involved uh, with the FEMA funded programs uh, since, uh, since Katrina. And we've seen a lot of great improvements over the years on what type of documentation uh, can be provided to FEMA uh, to validate that individual survivor's needs. But FEMA works with the states and then the states let bid to usually to non-governmental organizations. In some states, they allow for-profit groups uh, to also bid on that, but typically it's done through NGOs. And then the last type of disaster case management is uh, a FEMA cooperative agreement, and that's where the funding doesn't go through the state, but it actually goes uh, directly to the nonprofit. In Hurricane Harvey, uh, St. Vincent de Paul, United Methodist Committee on Relief, ICNA, a Lutheran Disaster Services, and UMCOR, we all participated with National VOAD in a program where National VOAD worked directly with FEMA uh, on a cooperative agreement. And that was a, a different type of model, but we did a collaborative with the, uh, with the National VOAD organizations, and that's called a cooperative agreement. Again, I'm getting some feedback. If you all could put your phones on mute, thank you. So what does a case manager do? Well, let's look at the, a, a sample job description. In long-term recovery, it's, their job is to identify needs and to connect the individual with resources. And some people say, well, can't the individual do that themselves? Well, no, as we talked about, there's, there's a percentage of the population that cannot recover on their own. And many times in disasters, we see 10% of the population won't be able to recover on their own that they'll need some additional assistance. And the case manager then will work with a group, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in the presentation, called a long-term recovery committee. And that's a committee that is developed by community partners that all get together and pledge funding uh, to help fund what state and federal resources can't pay for. So the case manager also does an assessment and we, put together, as I said, a recovery map, uh, recovery plan or a roadmap for the future. But we have to tweak that depending on the individual's needs. Sometimes we may say the individual may have to move out of the community. There may be no affordable housing in that community, or they may have to move uh, in with some relatives for a temporary period of time. Maybe they need to go back to school and get some retraining if they lost, if they're self-employed and they lost their job or if their place of work was destroyed. You probably saw on the news, um, there was a candle factory in Kentucky, in Mayfield, Kentucky. And there are a lot, it was one of the major employers in the community. And that candle factory is not gonna rebuild after the tornado that hit that area. So the hundreds of people that were employed there, when we're working in that community doing case management, we have to try to find other jobs or retraining for those individuals or sometimes relocate them to other communities. The case manager, one of the critical things is they're an advocate. And so they, they work with FEMA. We do, uh, we help the survivor if they get a denial letter from FEMA. We do FEMA appeals. We also work with the other community resources to determine uh, what we can do uh, if, if that individual needs, as I said, if they have to go back to school, do they have behavior health issues? What type of referrals do we need to make? So again, these are all things that an individual can't do on their own. One of the most important things that they do is they present their case to a group called the Long-Term Recovery Committee. And we're gonna look at the different models for long-term recovery. But they, it's important because these are gonna be needs that can't be met, as I said, through federal or state resources. They communicate the type of assistance to be provided by the long-term recovery groups. So they talk to the survivor and they say, this is what can be provided, uh, but maybe we can't get 100% of all your needs met because there's not resources in the community. So we have to think of some other plans that we need to do. So for example, right now we're working in Oregon and we have a lot of homes that were burned and we, there is a lack of, of property available to rebuild. So we have to work with the survivor to determine what other areas can they live in 
And is there affordable housing for that individual? So we have to be realistic and we have to let them know what's available in that community and what they may or may not be able to do. But again, it's so critical to have that long-term recovery committee uh, in your community uh, composed of community organizations that can help pledge uh, for additional assistance. And then the case manager also makes referrals for, to other organizations to fill gaps. So as I said, we're only looking at disaster related needs. When we see mental health related needs, it's important to know who those mental health providers are in the community. After a disaster hits, it's very traumatic for people. Um, a lot of people have PTSD if they've gone through previous disasters or if they've been living with COVID or have had you know, economic downturn uh, for any number of reasons, uh, then the disaster is just going to multiply their needs or their stress. And so it's important for us to know who are all those community providers. And, and not only are we gonna work with the disaster related needs, we're gonna be able to refer them to other groups. Uh, maybe the Salvation Army has a program, for example, uh, where they can do uh, deposits for utility deposits. And that's something that's not covered by FEMA. And then we also work to verify uh, that the assistance is provided and we document that in the case. The important thing of working together in a community and why case managers are so important and long-term recovery groups are so important is that we want to be able to have a force multiplier for all the resources that are in the community. And we don't want to duplicate benefits. So no matter if it's a voluntary program, if it's a FEMA funded program, if it's an NGO funded program, if it's a state funded program, all types of disaster case management require outreach and screening. So we have to, again, we can't assume everybody's gonna call 211 or an organization hotline. Uh, we have to get out there and we have to, you know, normally we'll go out to uh, community centers and put out flyers. We may walk neighborhoods if the homes are still standing. Uh, we may go to laundry mats. We'll go to, to libraries. Uh, we'll go to supermarkets. So you have to have ways other than just putting things on Facebook or on the internet. You have to have ways to get out there and do outreach in the community. And then you want to screen to make sure that the individual is a disaster impacted individual. Sadly, disasters bring out all types of people who will ask for assistance. And we have donated dollars or designated dollars for this disaster. And so we have to be very careful that we're screening that the, that the individuals do indeed have a disaster related need. If they have other needs that aren't disaster related, then again, we refer them out to other social service organizations. We do something called intake. So most disaster services organizations or do the do disaster case management have an intake form. Today, I'm gonna to show you a short intake form. It's not the long form that we use in FEMA programs, but it's a short form that we use with our voluntary programs. And we'll do a case study, but it'll give you an example of intake. And it's so important when you go through that intake to ask the right questions so that you can get enough information so that you can do the next step, the assessment and planning. So we have to look at, again, are they going to be someone that we can talk to once and do a referral and then we're done? Um, and that's like what we call a tier one case. Or is it going to be a complex case or a tier four? And again, I'm using disaster case management language. But the tier four case may be a situation where we have to work with that survivor and walk that road to recovery with them for up to two years. The recovery plans we've talked about, it's an actual document uh, and you work with the individual, you sit down and you list goals, you meet with them two or three times a month, you revisit those goals. In the COVID environment, it's been very difficult. Uh, we've done both virtual case management, but we've also done where we met the individual at their home or wherever they were staying. And then we did social distancing and masks and uh, talk to the individual and then put the forms down on the ground where they can actually come up and pick the forms up. So we've had to use all different types of models uh, working in the COVID environment. But if you could meet in person, it's best. 
uh, because you can really sense what the situation is with that individual. Uh, the lady in the picture is one of our case managers on a previous program. And you can see she's in the home and the home has a lot of needs. Uh, and she's actually going through and she's doing the assessment and planning. After you do the plan, then you follow up. Were they able to access the referrals you gave them? Did they follow the recovery plan? If they got FEMA benefits or state benefits, were they used for what they were intended? And then we do closure and evaluation. Uh, so we're going, you know, we have to close the case and that's a very difficult thing for disaster case managers. They want to stay for forever with that survivor or client. And then we do evaluation to look at were the services that we provided adequate? Did they meet the needs of the survivors? Do we make a difference in that community? Were we helping that community uh, to recover? So when you're putting, when you're doing a disaster case management program, it's important to bring in your national partners. Uh, Julia mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation, uh, the National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster. Uh, this is a group of national organizations. It's been around over 50 years. And these are some groups that do case management. Uh, there's many other groups that do case management, but these are some of the primary groups, Catholic Charities, Lutheran Social Services, American Red Cross, uh, St. Vincent de Paul, United Methodist Committee on Relief, and the Salvation Army. And all of these groups are known uh, groups that do, some of them do the initial phase of case management or case work, and some of them do long-term. Our organization, as I mentioned, does long-term. Um, so do the Lutherans and so does United Methodist and Catholic Charities and sometimes Salvation Army also. So um, it, it again, the long-term can be up to 24 months and sometimes even 36 months. But state FOEDs are very important too. So when we look at state VOADs, uh, the state it, VOAD is normally part of the integrated response of the state. They're part, you know, they work with hand in hand with emergency management. They're familiar with the geography and leadership of impacted areas. I was chair of the Texas Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster for two years, and I helped coordinate 17 major disasters, and it was quite an experience uh, to do that. They're also a central conduit for information and they can coordinate with other state, national and local partners. Uh, so for example, Julia and Carl and others may reach out to us and, or to uh, you know, uh, different groups that they know that like Mennonite Disaster Services or other groups and say, can you come in and can you help us with rebuilds or uh, to Team Rubicon, can you help with muck outs? So we all know different groups and each of us has different expertise and we're able to coordinate when a disaster happens and bring in the different groups, which is just wonderful that we can do that. And then uh, it, the state VOED also helps to build community capacity. Uh, they work, uh, they're always looking for new membership, they try to bring in different organizations, as I said, because different groups fill different needs. And because they're part of National VOED, they know how to connect the resources. And one of the critical things, as I said, we try to be a force multiplier. We don't want to duplicate benefits. So we want to see what everyone can bring to the table. And they, they can, again, uh, connect resources. <laughs> so this is kind of a busy, uh, map, roadmap on what it, when a disaster hits, but it's important to look at because there's a lot of aspects and a lot of moving parts when a disaster occurs. So you'll notice that uh, the disaster occurs and then you immediately have a local or a state response. And one of the critical things, and if emergency managers are on this call, you know you want that initial damage assessment because they need to get those numbers on impacted and affected homes. Uh, then emergency management can provide that uh, to the to the governor's office and to federal. The governor requests a presidential disaster declaration, and based upon the numbers and the magnitude, uh, you know they may get a presidential declaration, and that's when FEMA comes in, uh, and then FEMA, depending upon again the level of the disaster, FEMA can either. Uh, approve individual assistance, which is what we're talking about today, where they can also approve public assistance uh, 
to deal with infrastructure needs of the state or local government. Normally then FEMA develops a uh, joint field office where every, all the FEMA officials come together and uh, meet. And there can also be you know, the PA groups, the public assistance groups, and then the IA groups. And then the state officials will come to meetings there. With COVID, this has changed a lot. A lot of this again has been done virtually. Uh, but then the program administration begins and disaster assistance starts. And if you look in that middle arrow, the human services, uh, that's when we start disaster case management. And we usually start with disaster case work where we're working in shelters, maybe doing some initial intake. And then there's the mitigation and then there's the infrastructure support. So a lot goes on when a disaster happens. There's a lot of moving parts and we need all the players. And now I'm gonna let FEMA do this next slide. Yes, uh, thank you, Elizabeth. And speaking of moving parts, um, as you all know, we need everyone to work together in order to, to help those survivors. And we have something called the sequence of delivery or the sequence of disaster assistance, which is an order in which usually survivors get assistance from local organizations, from the volunteer agencies, from insurance, FEMA, uh, so as you can see on the slide, usually the volunteer organizations are the first one to help the survivors. They are local, they're on the ground, they know the community that was impacted. So they go ahead and the disaster happens and their main focus initially is serving those immediate emergency needs. So food, sheltering, emergency assistance, disaster spiritual care, and starting that cleanup process. But of course, some survivors, they have insurance. Right, And we want to make sure that we're taking advantage of all the resources available for that survivor. So there's a reason why, you know, we have insurance is because if something happens, we are covered. So usually they, uh, survivors, they can activate their insurance and homeowners, renters, they can, you know, um, get their, their flood insurance contacted just to see uh, what types of assistance they're going to get from their insurance. If they're not insured or underinsured and there is a FEMA uh, disaster declaration, then they can access those FEMA programs. So FEMA can help them with home repairs, temporary housing, medical, dental, uh, funeral assistance, child care. Um, some programs also uh, depend on what we call this small business administration loan. So people can also get a loan to try to cover for some of the costs. Uh, you know, the FEMA assistance is, there's a limit to how much uh, FEMA can assist. And sometimes going through a loan is an alternative to uh, recovering some of, the, some of that loss. So with the SBA programs, uh, survivors can get loans up to $200,000 for, for home repairs and for personal property up to $40,000. And if they don't qualify for the SBA loan or program, uh, sometimes they go back to us. So they come back to FEMA where FEMA might be able to provide additional resources with personal property, moving storage, transportation assistance. And finally, uh, it circles back to the volunteer organizations. Uh, we're not able to, uh, like I said in the beginning, uh, we need the help of everyone. So just today, for example, you know, I was in a call and we had someone say, hey, I'm working with a family that needs furniture assistance. And maybe for whatever reason, they couldn't qualify for that assistance through FEMA, or maybe it wasn't enough. Maybe they need that little extra help. So that's when we go in and we tap into the volunteer organizations, the you know, volunteer agencies, the local agencies to see, okay, is there any other resources in the community that could help? Do we need to do some fundraising? Do we need to contact some local philanthropy organizations to see if there's any grants or any other additional resources? Um, so that's, yeah, so that's the sequence of, of delivery of programs. And I know that we have so many of us here helping survivors and some families are still kind of in that process of being with the FEMA program, uh, but they're moving towards finding new homes. They're moving, you know, they might be moving out of the community. They might be getting to that stage where they've received the FEMA assistance. And now we need to see if there's any unmet needs that 
weren't still, you know, that still need to be resolved. And that's where we count on you and the case managers and the volunteer organizations. Thank you, Julia. And so as you could imagine for a survivor trying to navigate all this, I mean, Julia did a great job of navigating it, but she's a FEMA rep. And so, you know, most individuals don't understand this. And so uh, that's one of the importance of case management to help navigate all these different squares. So let's look at long-term recovery committees uh, and long-term recovery. So recovery uh, to each disaster is unique. Uh, and as we talked about, it goes beyond the initial phase of the disaster, which is the cleanup uh, to the rebuilding of homes. And it may last for years, as I talked about, I discussed how long Hurricane Katrina recovery went on. Uh, typically, uh, when we start the recovery phase, uh, we, we stop the emergency relief programs. And the, it's really important because you see all the water stacked up and there may be food that was donated. Uh, you know, you may have toiletries that are donated, but we really want to stop that process, uh, you know, may, maybe 30 days max, but a lot of times we say 14 days, because we want local stores to get up and, and you know, have people purchase things from the local merchants. And a lot of times when we get too many donated items, it becomes a disaster within a disaster. Uh, so we want to get to that phase where we can go into the next phase, which is recovery. You see a reduction of a lot of organizations, though. A lot of people, a lot of groups rush in at the beginning. I call it the CNN effect. They see it on the news. They see the disaster. They want to go help. They're there. But we really need people for the long haul because this is when the tough, tough part of recovery begins. Uh, and when we need it, uh, organizations to help with rebuilds, we need organizations to help with disaster case management. We need to be able, to, we need emotional and spiritual care uh, because people are going to be going through a very uh, traumatic part when they realize that, you know, their whole world has changed and they have to go into a new normal. And this may also begin the beginning of government mitigation programs. So people say, well, why do we need long-term recovery groups? Well, we need long-term recovery and long-term recovery groups when personal resources, insurance, government grants and loans are not sufficient to meet the need. Uh, because people assume that FEMA covers everything, FEMA can only cover certain things and that you know it's mandated by Congress and legislation on what they can cover. And uh, insurance only covers a percentage of what happens for individuals if they have insurance. And oftentimes we see people are underinsured. So it's, this is why it's very critical to go into the long-term recovery process. What is a long-term recovery group? Well, we're gonna look at different models that communities can put together, but there's a standard terminology that the long-term recovery group is a cooperative body made up of representatives from faith-based, nonprofit, government, business, and other organizations working together to help a community recover. This can be where you meet physically in person, or, and as I said, in the COVID world, we've been doing this virtually, but we really need all the different stakeholders in the community working together. To form a long-term recovery group, there needs to be different components, and this is something we teach in the National VOAD Recovery Tools Workshop. Uh, we need to have a team of volunteers that is looking at communication and advocacy with the community to educate other community organizations. Uh, we need, we need uh, spiritual and emotional care. We need a group dedicated to that because, uh, as I said, uh, the survivors are going to have needs other than physical needs and, and financial needs. We need a group of volunteers to develop resources. Julie just talked about how we have to look for funding. Uh, so we want to look for grants. We want to look for materials that we can get donated. And then we need a group to manage volunteers. You're always going to get all kinds of volunteers coming into a community after a disaster hits. And uh, we normally try to set up a voluntary reception center. Um, and that's important in each community because you have to be very cautious because groups self-deploying, again, that may create another disaster for you. You wanna make sure that volunteers are vetted, they have criminal background checks, and is there a need for whatever they're offering? So we wanna bring in groups, for example, 
uh, in the recovery phase that can help us with rebuilds, but we may not need groups that wanna come in and cook, for example, unless they're cooking for the volunteers, because as I mentioned, uh, when we're in recovery, we want to support the local merchants. And then donations management, uh, we, we get all kinds of donations. We would hope in recovery that we would get construction items like roofing, uh, shingles, uh, building materials, uh, furniture. Uh, St. Vincent de Paul does a program called House in a Box where we provide new furniture setups for individuals once their homes are built. But different groups provide different types of uh, donations. And again, you need a way to manage that uh, in a community. And if the recovery group is put together, uh, a group can be assigned or someone can do, get donated warehouse space. And then you have construction management and then the critical disaster case management. And you could have the long-term recovery group could have its own case managers. It could work with voluntary organizations with case managers. There's all different types of models on how this works. So people say, well, what does it look like? Well, some communities don't have enough organizations to do a formal long-term recovery group. So they might just put together an unmet needs committee. Um, and that committee may work virtually and the agencies just communicate uh, to this committee what they're doing. So for example, St. Vincent de Paul, uh, let's say if Julia with Lutherans, they had the, uh, she's chairing the unmet needs committee and we might call her and say, well, we're providing disaster case management for these families or we're providing house in the box. So that's what a, a more, uh, it's a less formal structure. And then you might have uh, what's called a long-term recovery committee uh, where it doesn't have bylaws, it's not incorporated. And that uh, depends upon each organization to pledge funds. So the Methodists may pledge funds for rebuild, uh, Salvation Army might pledge funds for rebuild, United Way. Um, there's a minimal amount of organization that's required to put this type of group together. And then you have a group called the Long-Term Recovery Organization. And that group, it tends to be an incorporated group uh, that gets its own 501c3. It's able to handle funds through the organization. It can apply for grants. And then I've also seen in, in mega disasters where you had uh, community coalitions for recovery. So for example, if you're in an area where you've got like 17 counties or 30 counties, or you know, you've got a disaster that crosses multiple counties, uh, then you may wanna look at something like that. So these are all different types of models for, for those uh, community leaders that are on the call today. I would ask you to think about what type of model would work best in your community, but you need to have something because what will happen is we don't want to have duplication of benefits and we don't want one individual survivor to have access to more resources than another. If you're going to have whole community recovery, it's critical to have some type of community recovery group uh, where resources can be funneled uh, to help survivors. And it's also a more equitable way to distribute goods and services because we can vet the survivor uh, we, we, as a case manager, will look to see uh, if you looked at that sequence of delivery that Julia described, we'll, we'll look to see what type of FEMA benefits they receive. Did they get any type of state benefits in the state they're residing in? And then what are their unmet needs that need to be filled after that? So again, there, we have a whole course at National VOAD, uh, for, and we offer that through the state VOAD. Uh, if you're interested in trying to set up a long-term recovery group or a long-term recovery organization, we can do that National VOAD Recovery Tools Workshop that goes through all the different components and what, what you need to do if you want to set up a, a incorporated long-term recovery group. If you just want to have a committee, uh, you can do that. But it's very critical to have some type of structure to help individuals recover. One of the important things that we look at though is effective local leadership. So these committees, whether it's an incorporated committee, an MMET needs committee, a long-term recovery group, it doesn't work unless you have an effective leader. The picture here is of a project that we participated in called ODRIP or the Oklahoma Disaster Recovery Project. It was a coalition of a number of national organizations, the Salvation Army, Red Cross, 
United Methodist Committee on Relief, St. Vincent de Paul. We all worked together. Uh, we actually put together an office. We were working with eight uh, long-term recovery groups across eight different counties. Each of the long-term recovery groups had their own bylaws and rules and resources. So we had to train our case managers on how to present a case to each of those eight different counties. It's a very complex process, but it was a large disaster. This was in uh, 2013 after the uh, major tornadoes that hit the state of Oklahoma. But because and some of the leaders that you see there in the picture were great servant leaders, they were very effective. They met, they worked together, they developed a plan, uh, they put together some rules on how we were going to work as organizations, who was going to provide what, how we we're going to provide case management. And then they communicated effectively across all the eight different counties with all the long-term recovery groups. So it was a very successful project, but it, if we hadn't had outstanding local leaders, uh, it wouldn't have been successful. So again, you need to identify in your community or in your county, who, who could be a good leader? Who would be able to lead up a long-term recovery group? Who could communicate? Who can engage other partners and stakeholders? And we want not just nonprofits sitting at the table. We want your local chamber of commerce, uh, maybe the local school superintendent. In this particular disaster, we had the school superintendent was on one of the committees. You want some key business leaders. Who are people that are movers and shakers in your community? that can help bring in dollars and resources to the long-term recovery group. So you want to, when you're organizing your, your recovery group, it's important to, as I said, to engage stakeholders. Send out a, you know, we had that town hall meetings. We had town hall meetings in eight different counties uh, where we worked with all the different leaders uh, to try to set up these uh, recovery groups. You want to assess the needs. Uh, what are the needs in that community? You want to have a mission statement for your recovery group. You want to have organizational documents, so forms. So each of these eight counties, for example, gave our case managers what their forms that, that were going to be used. And those forms had to be used to present cases to their particular county long-term recovery group. And then they identified resources within their community. And then they had very rigid financial management. If you're getting donated dollars and whether you have a, a incorporated 501c3 long-term recovery group or you have an unincorporated, whatever the structure is, whoever gives you money, somebody has to account for those dollars and you wanna have accountability and transparency because you wanna be able to report back to donors how you were able to assist your community. The better the transparency, the more funding you can get uh, because if, if it's a well-organized machine, people will want to give to you and they want to see reports and they want to see survivor success stories. It also gets out in the community too, if a group is organized or not, uh, because survivors will talk. They will talk about whether they were assisted and what the process was. And you want to make sure whatever you do, that you have a process that a case manager can follow and that you give them the forms and the training necessary. An example I gave in Oklahoma where we were working with eight different counties, we had to train the case managers again on what the process was for each county because each county had a different long-term recovery group. So it's important for us to be able to engage and to work with those communities and understand what their rules of engagement were. So here's some examples uh, from other disasters. And this is an all-inclusive and there's other organizations and other groups. So my apologies if I missed somebody in this, but this is just an example uh, from what we've seen in other communities. So for example, in the long-term recovery group is case management. You might have United Methodist might be part of that group, uh, Catholic Charities, the Red Cross, St. Vincent de Paul, Lutheran Disaster Services, ICNA. Uh, for community needs assessment, that might be World Renew. Uh, for construction management, that might be Mennonite Disaster Services or United Methodist Committee on Relief. This is going to vary depending upon your state, your community, your county, but these are just some examples. And then for uh, long-term rebuilding groups, uh, we tend to bring in national voluntary organizations that can come in and help with rebuilds and that will have the resources to do that. 
This is going to vary depending upon the requirements, your zoning requirements in your county. If we bring in voluntary groups, uh, then they need to have you know, certain permitting ability. They need to understand, they may need to have uh, licensed uh, plumbers and electricians. So we can't always assume that one organization can come in because there may be restrictions based upon the county's permitting requirements. And some of the work may be able to be done by voluntary organizations, but we also may have to bring in uh, professional groups and pay for that. So that's another important thing why we have to raise dollars. Because again, when a community rebuilds for mitigation purposes, they may change some of the zoning rules. And then we have volunteer management and hosting. You have to have somebody that can take care of the volunteers because a lot of times there's no place for them to stay. Uh, so Presbyterian disaster assistance and both Lutheran disaster assistance are great. They often either set up villages or tent cities or have homes. And that's important to take care of the volunteers. I mean, people are given their time to come into a community and we wanna do what we can to try to offset those costs. We talked about warehousing and donations management and Adventist Community Services is known nationally for doing that. And then we have the emotional and spiritual care and Presbyterian Disaster Assistance has a great program. Um, and there's a Light Our Way is a document that was printed uh, through a coalition of national VOAD members. And it's something that you can give out uh, to disaster survivors and also work with your own groups. A lot of times when we're going through a disaster, our disaster case managers uh, need the emotional and spiritual care because they listen day in and day out to the stories of survivors and they get worn out and we have to do care for the caregivers. So you can see there's a lot of players and a lot of components when we do long-term recovery. So all disasters are local and it's gonna depend upon your local community. I can't give you, you know, 100% what you should do for your community. I can make recommendations based on what we've done in other states and other counties and other parishes as we say in Louisiana, uh, but it's going to depend upon your local capacity. So as I said, maybe your community can only do an unmet needs committee. Maybe you can do a formal 501c3 long-term recovery group. It's going to vary. Um, and states have different state partnerships and state VOADs have different members. Um, and so it's going to be important to know what those members are. That's why it's key if your state VOAD has access to national VOAD members because they can bring in other NGOs. Uh, the sequence of delivery, it's going to be impossible for survivors to recover on their own without having a long-term recovery group. And as I said, long-term recovery groups build local capacity and resiliency and they help with the equitable distribution of goods. The other thing that happens is sometimes you build your community you bring together stakeholders that can help with other community events beyond disasters. And they can help with long-term economic recovery in the community. I've seen some of these long-term recovery groups work uh, to do business rebuilds. Uh, they initially got together to help with individual survivor rebuilds, but then they were able to go on and help with doing whole community rebuilds. So now we're going to, um, look at FEMA is going to do a presentation for us on how a survivor can apply for FEMA benefits, what's covered by FEMA, what the required documentation is, how an individual can avoid duplication of benefits, and then the appeals process. And after FEMA's presentation, we're going to look at some intake for an intake form. We're going to look at a release of information form. And then we're going to prepare a case. And you're going to get to work on a case uh, to prepare for presenting to a long-term recovery group. As I mentioned on that situation in Oklahoma where we had eight different counties, you can pretend that you're presenting to one county in Pennsylvania and how you would present a case. So I'm going to turn it over to FEMA. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And now Alicia, if you're ready. Hello, good afternoon. Um, let me share my screen. I'm, uh, give me a moment. Okay. I think that I have shared. Yes. Perfect. 
Thank you. So first of all, hello, Pennsylvania. Um, I just want to first say that the VOADs are my personal heroes in the recovery process. Um, my favorite part of recovery is what disaster case management and long-term recovery groups do because our assistance, like you've said many times, is very limited. A case manager's role serves much more than um, FEMA's ability. Um, so, uh, you know, for assistance that can't be met by federal or state resources. So thank you for having me. And um, please know that you do make a, a difference in the recovery process. So let's start with, I'm going to have to move through this very quickly because of limited time until we get to the appeals process, appeal opportunities, and the written consent form. Okay, so first of all, the general conditions of IHP eligibility start with um, the applicant must be a U.S. Uh, citizen, non-citizen, national, or qualified alien. Um, we must be able to verify an applicant's identity and the applicant's insurance or other forms of disaster assistance received cannot meet their disaster cause needs. And the applicant's disaster cause needs were direct, uh, direct results of the presidentially declared disaster and the applicant must be compliant with flood insurance requirements when apl applicable. Um, our program IHP is broken into two categories, um, housing assistance for this year and for Pennsylvania for 4618. Um, the, the cap for housing assistance is 36,000, uh, the same um, separated with their own, with the a separate uh, limit is 36,000 for other needs assistance. Housing assistance can uh, consist of rental assistance, repair, replacement, permanent construction, and then other needs is personal property, transportation, medical, dental, and funeral expenses. Housing assistance. Applicants may receive financial assistance for disaster caused housing needs. We may provide direct assistance when applicants are unable to make use of financial assistance due to a lack of available housing resources. The amount of financial assistance an individual or household may receive under IHP is limited. FEMA adjusts these uh, maximum awards each year based on the Department of Labor Consumer Price Index, and FEMA provides 100% of the cost associated with housing assistance. Um, financial assistance for housing includes lodging expense reimbursement, rental assistance, repair assistance, replace assistment, uh, assistance, and then direct assistance or direct, which we don't have um, a housing mission for Pennsylvania, but that would include um, the multifamily lease and repair, manufactured housing units, direct lease, and permanent or uh, semi-permanent housing construction. Housing assistance financial. So FEMA determines the appropriate types of housing assistance for which an individual or household may be eligible based on disaster cause loss, access to life-sustaining service services, cost effect effectiveness, and other factors. Lodging expense reimbursement, which is another form of financial assistance to reimburse applicants for hotels, motels, or other short-term lodging. Rental assistance, which is financial assistance to rent. Alternative housing um, while an applicant is displaced. Um, and then home repair assistance, which is also a form of financial assistance to repair an owner-occupied primary residence. And then um, home replacement assistance. Disaster called losses uh, to accessibility related real property items for applicants with a disability or other access and functional needs are not subject to the um, uh, financial assistance maximum. Other needs assistance, which we oftentimes called, call ONA, uh, may receive financial assistance for certain disaster caused necessary expenses and serious needs 
FEMA provides 75% of the costs associated with ONA and the state, territorial or tribal government provides the remaining 25%. HA and ONA have independent and equal financial maximums. And that's important to remember when we start talking about appeal opportunities. Um, there's also, as we know, the, uh, some ONA may be considered SBA dependent. So real quickly, uh, the non-SBA dependent areas of assistance include funeral assistance, medical, dental, childcare, assistance with miscellaneous um, items, moving and storage, critical needs assistance, clean and uh, removal assistance. We've kind of shortened the SBA dependent areas. So all we have to remember is personal property transportation and the group flood insurance policy. Those are dependent on an SBA loan. Um, there are, again, there's two types of ONA, non-SBA and SBA dependent. The non-SBA dependent um, the applicant does not have to complete a loan packet to receive this kind of assistance. Non-SBA dependent ONA includes, again, funeral, medical and dental, child care, assistance to miscellaneous other items purchased after the, uh, after the disaster, such as chainsaws, dehumidifiers, and then moving, moving and storage and critical needs assistance. SBA dependent requires the applicant uh, to have been turned down for an SBA loan. SBA dependent ONA includes, again, three things, which is personal property transportation and the GFIP. Disaster calls losses to accessibility related personal property uh, for applicants with a disability or other access functional needs are not subject to the financial assistance. And this is important and we'll explain later when we get to the appeal opportunities, which we are here. So appeal opportunities. And this is for applicants, you know, there's, there's gonna be many times that our applicants are gonna need to appeal the initial assistance, like proving occupancy, proving ownership, but let's talk about those that are have been found eligible. Those that have been found eligible have so many appeal opportunities. Um, let's start with the housing assistance side under home repair, private wells, furnaces, septic systems, and privately owned access roads and bridges, and ADA access ramps and grab bars. Um, these are appeal opportunities simply because when, when FEMA initially provides assistance, it's only for a service call. And that is for the, uh, the applicant to hire someone to tell them what the need is. So at that point, all we need is, uh, these items can be paid at actual. And that's important in understanding these appeal opportunities because all we need is a signed written appeal and a verifiable contractor's estimate in order to assist these folks with the actual cost to replace these items. Keep in mind, and this is important, that there are uh, there there is a, a cap on what we can assist with. So the items that are subject to a cap, which is for this year for Pennsylvania is 36,000 are private wells, furnaces, septic systems, and privately owned access roads and bridges. Those are uh, subject to the, uh, the housing maximum. When it comes to ADA access ramps and grab bars, we've removed that from the cap and those can be paid and assisted with on top of that 36,000 cap. Another very wonderful appeal opportunity for folks in Pennsylvania is the home repair level of damage. So we are assessing losses with what we're calling a level of damage. So if somebody received a, a dollar amount, all they need, to, and it's not sufficient to cover their losses, all they need to do is submit a signed written appeal 
and a verifiable contractor's estimate so that we can review that and see if we can bump them up to the next level of damage. And then on the other needs assistance side, um, we have personal property and there's another appeal opportunity. It could be that their personal property was assessed as repairable and um, there's an opportunity to appeal for replacement consideration. Um, transportation repair, another outstanding appeal opportunity. We initially for Pennsylvania are, are only assisting initially if the vehicle is repairable with $50. However, all we need is a written appeal, a signed written appeal and a mechanics estimate showing what it will cost to repair that vehicle. And we can repair it up to the max, which for Pennsylvania is $9,399. And then we have the ONA ADA items that we can also pay it actual. We're gonna, and we're gonna initially um, provide assistance at a bare minimum to assist with these ONA ADA items. And these are things like wheelchairs, walkers, um, uh, accessibility beds. And I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember them all, but this information is available online and Julia can, you know, can can forward that information to you since our time is limited. Please keep in mind, though, that these items are subject to the ONA maximum with the exception of the ONA ADA items. When we pay those items, that is outside the ONA cap. Okay, so now to the written consent part. I have actually learned a lot about this form in the last couple of days because I analyzed some of the written consents that we have received at the NIPSI from uh, Pennsylvania. And I, I, I wanna share what I've learned because I think this is really important. I'm gonna blow this up a little bit. Okay, so first of all, I think for, for the purpose of the vowels and the VOADs being able to receive and communicate, it's important to understand this form and what's needed and what's not. So as you go through this form, you will see that the um, it's gonna tell you what's optional, what's not required. For example, um, right here, it's stating that the FEMA application number is optional. Well, it would be very beneficial if we had that because it could help us attach it to the correct file. However, it's not required in order to accept that written consent. Um, the other areas in here are required, like uh, the birthplace, the date of birth, of course, the signature on the next page, which we'll get to. Um, what we did when we consolidated and provided this form is we, we included a copy or a file copy request. So if you'll notice on section A, it says optional. When our applicants are filling this out, it's very important to understand that um, I think what we're looking for here in order to be able to share information with our VOADs and our voluntary agencies is not so much the file copy request, which you have every right to request and so does our applicants. But what we are needing here is basically to check this, to check number two. And then when, you, when we get to the next page, I'll explain why. So when you're filling, when we are filling out this form under section A, this is only if we are requesting a copy of the file. And um, please be advised that these copies are hundreds of pages. I, I don't, I mean, I'm not saying that, that you shouldn't request that by any means, but what we're really looking for is First of all, when you put a name in this section, in section A, and you select yes to number one, if you put a name here, whether it's a, an attorney that's trying to help an applicant, if we have disaster legal services in place, 
um, we're going to send a copy of that file uh, to the address selected, the name of the attorney, the name of the disaster case manager that may be requesting a copy of this file. But then also, please keep in mind that there is a lot of um, privacy information that we are responsible for if we receive these copies. So um, it's very important that if an applicant decides to put a person's name here and then checks number two or one, that what number three actually is asking for is that applicant to specify, yes, it's okay to share my file with whomever they choose, but please don't include my social security number or my um, banking information. So that's actually what number three is referring to here. I have looked at the written consents that we've received from Pennsylvania, and there seemed to have been a little bit of confusion as to what this, what these two sections mean. So I just wanted an opportunity and thank you uh, for the opportunity to discuss this so that we can all be on the same page with the written consent. And now, Alicia, sorry, this is Julia. So just to clarify, say we have a case manager that wants, you know, a survivor that is sharing that information to a case manager. They want their case manager, you know. Uh, so they write it down under section B in that other column, right? So they check the, the yes square and then the name, they write down the name of the case manager, for example. Okay, so it, I, I had, I was so fortunate because I got to work with the mailroom supervisor to, to help me understand this form. So if, if your case manager needs or wants and the applicant is okay with it, the case manager can absolutely request a copy of the entire file, which again is a lot of pages of stuff. Um, and if that's the case, then the case manager's name will need to be written here in section A, along with the phone number and then the address. And then over here under relationship, it would simply say something like case manager. Um, if all they, if all the case manager is needing is access to the information, then they would not need to check number one. They would just need to check number two, that it's okay to share information. And that would give the case manager the authority to even call our helpline and ask questions about the assistance the applicant received and you know perhaps why they were denied um, anything in, in their file. I, I, I hope I answered your question. If not, Julia, let me yes. know. Yeah, thank you, Alicia. Okay, thank you. Um, so we go to the second page and for the purpose of of this project, or for, for lack of better words, I think that all we would need to do is go over here to the to section C, which is optional, and check off who we want this, who, who the applicant wants FEMA to share any of this information with. So I think if, um, if we list state agencies offering disaster assistance, Number two, local, regional, state, national VOED organizations, members of Congress, other staff, media representatives, which you know some people might not want that. Um, but I, I, I think it's important that, that applicants understand when they fill this form out, um, the importance of, of, of checking these boxes off because we are, we are releasing personal private information. And, um, and I think that what I've seen in reviewing these written consents is that some applicants may not have fully understood what they were requesting. Maybe they didn't need a full file copy, uh, you know, of their FEMA file. Maybe they were just wanting to give FEMA permission to work with our VOADs and our voluntary agencies give them permission 
to work with FEMA and to speak with FEMA on their behalf. So I think in, in, this, per, in this instance, section C is really all we need. But again, I'm not saying that you don't have the right to ask for a file copy. You can do that right here. And then one thing I did learn from um, analyzing all of these written requests is that um, from our mailroom supervisor, who's responsible for sending out all these file copy requests is that we're only gonna send one. So if you list the, if the applicant wants a copy of their file and you put it here, and then maybe the applicant puts another name here, a family relative or a voluntary agency, we can only send one copy and it's gonna go to the applicant. There's a question in the chat box. So. Oops, can't see the quick chat box, Terry. Alicia, <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Alicia and everyone. This is Tracy Opperly. I'm the Deputy IA Branch Director for FEMA for this event, and I have volunteered to help uh, answer questions. So I will read the question. Um, and then uh, basically the question is, let me scroll. Well, prior to reading and answering the question, Alicia, I want to uh, comment on your comment, which is absolutely true. For the purposes of this form, section A is generally used for when uh, the daughter of a, of, a, of a survivor, a family member, or other person, and in some cases a lawyer or something like that, needs to have access to the file to assist that applicant. It's one specific person, and it will only ever be that one specific person for the purposes of case management, referrals, DOB checks, everything of that nature, it's section C that should be the consent. If uh, be for the purposes that you listed also, they may not wanna consent you know, to a case manager having access to certain information, which they will, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. The, the trouble that we find in doing that is that sometimes case managers don't remain the same for the same person. And then the applicant would have to submit another written consent with a different name. That's why we do use section C. And the, the question is, do uh, would local agencies have to be listed separately from the state or VOAD agencies? For example, a local emergency management or HHS provider is local covered under the existing uh, check boxes. And I think that the boxes uh, do, you know, kind of represent themselves. So um, I guess maybe I would ask Sarah to give us an example on a local agency. A local agency was part of the... Um, local, regional, state, or national VOAD, then they would be covered. If they are not, then they would not, which kind of yeah. um, yeah. previous presentation. Sure, Tracy. Uh, this is Sarah. I work for Philadelphia OEM, so I am a local emergency manager um, in one of the designated counties. And I know, Tracy, you and I have had conversations about, you know, trying to get some information about some of our survivors. Um, and so my question is about Right, so I'm looking at this. I'm obviously not a media representative. I'm not a member of Congress. But because I am a government agency and not a VOAD, um, I don't believe that I'm covered under section two, but I'm also not a state agency either. Um, but I have a very, you know, I have an important role in working with my survivors and also making sure that we, we aren't duplicating benefits either. And so that's my question is, is as a local emergency manager, as a local health and human services provider, am I covered if somebody goes through and checks all those boxes? And, or do people have to specifically say under number five that they wanna include the local emergency manager? And if they have to add that, are survivors being told that? Because I can see a real information gap, right? If you have people that think they're sharing the information, but they aren't because you can't share with the locals and that just that misunderstanding and not understanding how emergency management works. Does that help clarify the question? It does help clarify the question. I'm gonna give you what I think is the answer and then follow up. Yes, they would have to write that under number five. So they would have to be aware and they would have to write in there uh, that it would be the local emergency manager if that emergency management organization isn't part of one through four. Um, and no, we as FEMA are not telling people what they should or shouldn't put on this form. We can't. This, we don't want to try to um, 
encourage or discourage. It's up to each individual applicant which entity they would like to share any of their information with and for what purposes. So um, we sent, we can mail it to them. They can access this form from their DAC account, but uh, the provision of it back to FEMA is based, and what they put on it is based solely on their interest and any communication that they may have with the agencies that either have reached out to them or that they have reached out to uh, for assistance. And if anybody- so that, requ that requires the survivor to understand the emergency management structure, right? We have people that go to this, you know, call Pima all the time because they don't know that Philly OEM is a thing, uh, much yet what our role is. And yet, you know, Tracy, you and I and Julia and Stephanie, right? We've had all these conversations about the needs of our survivors. And uh, so yeah. it requires my survivor to know that I exist and that I'm I'm a part of this conversation and then to fill out this written consent and specifically specify my office. I think in your, and we can, you know, certainly continue to discuss it. I think in your situation, what we talked about is that the, you know, the, the issues that we have had uh, with FEMA and the privacy office and our information sharing that is actually uh, getting much better and very quickly. If the um, Philadelphia OEM is offering some type of assistance that's very specific, like for example, it's home repair to homeowners or it's um, furniture to renters, then we can start working on those information sharing access agreements that would be able to provide you with limited information uh, without a lot of PII, but would, for example, have the address and phone number of uh, applicants who meet the criteria for which whatever your program is offering. And so that's how I would uh, recommend that we do that being able to obtain a written consent in the time frame that it would take for us to scan them into everyone's files. And then you would still have to reach out for each individual applicant. Um, I, you know, I don't know, but I'm certainly willing to uh, continue to have that conversation with you and engage with privacy and see what, um, you know, advancements have been made in the last few weeks and how we can best do that. And, I, and we're all, you know, poised to support you. And I do understand your frustration. I don't know if anybody else from FEMA on the call uh, yeah, I'll just say that it's impacting our long term recovery conversations, which is why I'm I'm kind of continuing to push this this question. It's directly tied to our long term recovery planning. So if I if you don't mind, and I am not a, a long term recovery expert, I'm more of an IHP program by by any means. But so uh, I, I guess I'm curious um, the resources that are being offered by the OEM, um, and it's probably maybe something that I'm directing at Elizabeth to to say, because that was the best presentation I have ever heard in 17 years uh, on how the OEM can involve themselves with a long-term recovery committee or VOAD so that the applicants can get the benefit of whatever it is that they're offering uh, without making them literally jump through hoops with forms and things that they don't understand and we wouldn't want someone to sign away. I think everybody knows where I'm going. So I'll stop there, Elizabeth, I see you're on, thank you. Yeah, so I think, Tracy, for, for if we're dealing with this like OEM or state agency and they're doing a lot of survivors, I think the ISA agreement is the way to go and to list information that they would need specifically rather than to try to go individually with this form. So, okay, I know that was a lot of information and we're going to go back now and we're going to look at our presentation and we're going to talk about case. So let's go down to that. Bear with me just a moment. Let me get back to where we were. And thank you for that FEMA presentation. It's a lot of information. It's important for all of us to understand the process. Oops, <laughs> sorry. Okay. version of the intake, uh, we're going to uh, we're going to uh, look at FEMA release form.
point, we're going to prepare the case to uh, send to the long term recovery committee. Am I the only one to see this frozen? No, it's pretty frozen here too. Yeah, I think we might have some connectivity issues. Uh, Elizabeth, do you mind trying to uh, share your screen again? Okay. Okay, I'm going to reboot here just a second. Bear with me. Okay, can you see the screen now? There we go. It's loading. There we go. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right, so we're gonna look at an intake form. And this is a very basic intake form and I'm sure different organizations have different forms. This is what we use for our initial case work, but we're gonna use this for the case study. Um, so it's important, and this is not the correct DR number, this was from another disaster, but the DR number we're gonna list if it's a federally declared uh, disaster, we're gonna put the disaster number there so that we know what particular disaster and survivor we're dealing with. As you can see, we've got the name, the preferred contact number, the alternate contact number, the street address. I'm not gonna go through all these for time's sake, but one of the important things is, uh, are you currently displaced and where they're staying now? Um, and we need to know where their disaster impacted home was. And then we want household information. We need to know the age of the members in the household, the number of people. The other thing that we always do, and this is kind of a humanitarian, uh, aspect is we ask them to list pets because for many individuals their pets are part of their household and it's it's and they want to tell you if they lost a pet in the disaster and so when we're doing intake it's important to not only listen about the family members but the individuals when we're doing disaster case management we don't ask the the survivor to fill this out they've already been through enough we're actually interviewing them and we're taking down the information and it's best if this can be done in person. So you can watch their body language. You can also be there to assist them. Sometimes they may start crying in the middle of this process. Uh, it's, it's very painful for them. Or maybe they've told five different organizations. They've already gone through a number of intakes. They're very frustrated. They may uh, not understand this process with applying for other state or federal processes. So again, it's important to do the interview with them. And we always want to get case managers that have uh, the good communication skills and they're caring and compassionate. We want to know their household income. That's going to be important uh, because there may be certain programs that are income dependent. And we want to know uh, how did they lose their job uh, during the disaster? Were they self-employed and was their place of business destroyed? And they're going to look at types of recovery resources uh, that they will need. Uh, we wanna know if they've applied to FEMA. We always put them through the FEMA process. One of the things I tell our St. Vincent de Paul groups, they wanna run out and they wanna pay for hotel stays and other assistance. We first, in a federally declared disaster, we wanna make sure that everyone is registered for FEMA. If FEMA has get, sent them SBA information, we want to counsel the applicant on SBA. And SBA is not a bad thing. And so many people are confused and they say, why would I get an SBA application? I'm not a small business. Uh, but as Julia explained, the SBA is what's used uh, for individual assistance uh, the, in, in disasters. And they can get SBA. The loans are very low interest. And there's also uh, con SBA contents. 
On recovery needs, we want to go through and check all the different needs that they may have. And it's very important to check all of these. Um, sometimes, you know, they may need funeral assistance. And that's when we talked about ONA, if that's something that they may qualify for through ONA. They may have lost all their clothing. Uh, they may need job training. I mentioned that earlier when I was talking about the cases in Oklahoma. Mold remediation. A lot of times we see people living in mold infested homes. They go back to their homes. Uh, do they need transportation assistance? Do they lose their vehicle? So these are all, again, this is just a sample form. There's different forms that you can use, but we would want the case manager then to put any additional comments uh, that the individual may have. I remember I was interviewing a woman uh, in Hurricane Irma at a FEMA disaster recovery center in St. Vincent de Paul was set up there with FEMA and FEMA would bring applicants over to us who needed some additional attention. And I asked her, uh, you know, did she have any pets in the household? Uh, did she have anyone? Did she, what are the needs? And I went through all these different needs. And when I mentioned funeral assistance, she started crying and screaming and, oh my goodness, it was an awful situation. And her husband had died when they were evacuating for Hurricane Irma. And that was one of those really tough times. And we had to take her over to another area and just sit down with her and try to work with her uh, to get her stabilized. And then luckily we had mental health resources at the Disaster Recovery Assistance Center. So that's why you wanna have compassionate individuals that are working with people because you never know one of these questions may trigger something in that survivor. So we're gonna ask all the different needs that they have, and then we're going to sign this. And this is gonna be an important document for us because when we look at all these different needs that are checked off, then we're gonna determine, are, can these needs be filled by FEMA or, or do we need to take it to a long-term recovery table? So FEMA talked about this form. It's very important again, for disaster case management organizations, we definitely want to get this, so we don't want to duplicate benefits. If FEMA has covered certain things, if they've given the applicant funds for house repairs or other, other needs assistance, we need to know that so that we don't take a case to the long-term recovery table and present it on something that FEMA has already paid for. The other thing that we do as case managers is we want to counsel applicants and survivors that if FEMA gave them funds for a specific purpose, it needs to be used for that purpose uh, because we don't want them to have to repay the federal government. These are federal funds and they're designated for the purpose intended on their, their award letter. So they, we caution them on if to hold on to the dollars for rebuild, uh, not to use them for other things that it wasn't intended for. So it's very important to be, for us to be able to get this information. And thank you all for explaining this because uh, this is a fairly new form that's being used across the country. And it's important for case management organizations to have access to that information. So we're going to uh, look at a case. Um, so I would like you just to take a few minutes and then we can raise hands. We're gonna look at this particular case uh, of, of the individual. This is a person uh, who is, her name is Ima, or Irma, excuse me. Uh, she's, uh, she's unemployed. Uh, she, her spouse is disabled. She has, her home was damaged by Hurricane Ida. They also have a 10 year old grandson that's living with them and their dog, Benny. Uh, when the storm hit, they evacuated to her sister's home uh, but her sister, uh, who, like her family, uh, was, is on um, below the federal poverty level, and so her sister was not able to keep the family. Uh, when, when Hurricane Ida hit, she had a job prior uh, at a nursing home. Because of COVID cases, uh, the nursing home had to lay her off, and she no longer is employed. Unfortunately, she stopped paying her homeowner's insurance when she lost her job. And this is before the storm hit. So she's in a very tough situation. Uh, FEMA gave her 7,000 for repairs. Uh, part of her roof is missing. And the floors were heavily damaged from rain. You are her case manager. What unmet needs from the survivor would you present to the long term recovery committee? So let's take uh, about 
eight minutes. And uh, if you can jot down, I'm gonna leave this up here. So if you can jot down, how would you, given all the information you have on the intake form and, and what we've discussed and what FEMA discussed on what they can cover, what would you do to help the survivor? So let's take a few minutes to do that. And also note all the uh, health needs of this family when you're thinking about what you would present and how you would help on the recovery plan. So again, you're trying to determine using the intake form that we looked at, and you should have a copy of that from your email that was sent out. How are we going to help Irma recover? And then if you could raise your hand, uh, then we'll, I can call on people to give and you a Elizabeth, I do see a hand raise. So I'm not sure if you, should we call them out now or wait? Yeah. Is it floor? I'm trying to see from here too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, tell, tell us who you're with, Floor. <laughs> um, I'm with Aclamo Family Centers in Norristown, PA. Uh -huh. um, so as a case manager, I would start by completing an ease assessment to see uh, exactly what the client needs in, in depth, like food, necessities, uh, mental health treatment, so that I can, uh, you know, refer them to those other agencies as well as providing the food and everything they need um as well as helping them figure out like if they need to pay the electricity and things like that to get them funding for that um through the state um and as well as finding them a contractor to complete the repairs in the household that will be my first uh things to do 
Okay, that's a that's a good start. So anybody else, what are we going to do if this family is in this mold infested home? Okay, Jen. Uh, I've pretty much this the a similar uh, assessment um, going through all the different uh, utilities, um, getting an estimate for different repairs that need to be done. I've found is helpful um, when looking for uh, ways to fill the gap and for resources to fill the gap. It's been helpful to have estimates on hand already, um, just to know how, what needs to be done and how much that will cost in the long run. Okay. So this was actually a real case that I've changed the name and I've made it applicable to, uh, to Pennsylvania. But this particular case was a real case. And unfortunately, because there was a, a child involved, we had to do a, a domestic welfare check. Uh, when we did the domestic welfare check on this family, again, because they're having the child living in the conditions, the mold infested, the grandparents didn't have legal custody of the child. The child was temporarily removed, sadly, from the family after the domestic welfare check. Uh, we were able to work with the grandparents to get them legal guardianship of this child. And I, I can't go into all the other details because of privacy, but this was a very complex situation. It also, we had to move the family. We went to the long-term recovery committee and we requested the long-term recovery committee work with the family to get them into a temporary housing until such time as we could get uh, voluntary groups to come in and help. FEMA could only give them what they could give them because there was deferred maintenance on the home from prior disasters. But sometimes when we look at cases on the face, we don't always see everything. And if we hadn't done the domestic welfare check, we wouldn't have known about the legal issues with the grandchild. It turned out to be a good thing in the long run because we were able to get legal guardianship with the grandparents or legal custody, but it's very difficult for the child. It's a very painful experience. It was a painful experience for the grandparents. So there's a lot that goes into case management. We were very fortunate that we could write up the case and all your answers are great because you wanna look at the mental health, you wanna look at the medical needs, uh, you wanna see what you can do to get local contractors. And maybe you can get voluntary groups through the long-term recovery group but sometimes you have to also look at all the legal aspects and who can represent each of the individual, who legally can represent the child. So these are some things to think about when you're doing disaster case management. Uh, cases can be complex. This is what we would call a tier four case, uh, a very vulnerable population that has multiple issues. As you can see, the child has ADHD, uh, the husband's in a wheelchair, She's lost her job. We needed to work with Irma on some uh, emotional and spiritual care and some mental health needs from dealing with all this of losing her job, trying to provide for the family, having the grandson removed, so lots of issues here. So very critical to have those national VOAD, state VOAD, and have that long-term recovery committee that you can take a case to uh, because when you're trying to go run around and find different organizations in a community to get resources, it's difficult when you're dealing with hundreds of cases. If you have that long-term recovery group, you can uh, have the case manager present that case, get all the needs assessed, and then bring in, as I said, you have all those committee members that have resources at the table that can help provide for the survivor. So could you to, could you speak to when in that process you would have the make sure the written consent was for, signed, and also both folks mentioned a contractor, which could be one way of going about things. But could you talk a little bit about how there might be voluntary like a yeah. volunteer labor as well as a possibility? Well, we would immediately May have ask? the when we do the intake, we would immediately have the uh, all the the release form side because we couldn't advocate without the release forms. Yes, Teresa. Jen Manthe has her hand raised as well. I'm not sure you can see that. So when you finish with that question, you might want to see what Jen's got on her mind. 
Okay. All right. Sorry, it was yeah. still raised from the last time. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. All right. So sometimes you're going to be in situations, Julia, where you have the county requires licensed contractors. You may have voluntary groups that have those licenses, like licensed plumbers, electricians. It depends, as I mentioned, it depends upon the county and the rules. You have to know what the local permitting rules are. If you can use voluntary labor, that's great. But there may be times you need to go to the unmet needs table or the long-term recovery committee and say, we need to request, uh, you know, 150,000 to bring in contract. In Hurricane Sandy, we were in situations in New Jersey where we had to have licensed contractors. So we would present, you know, $150,000 plus of repairs that need to be done to a home and bring, and we would have each of the organizations pledge dollars uh, to be able to provide those type of repairs. It's gonna depend upon the county and the situation of, of the survivor. On the intake process, you'd have to have that release signed at the very beginning because you couldn't advocate for that individual without having all those releases. Other questions? else okay yeah so i see here that it's 2 45 and we did have perfect timing uh we do have additional 15 minutes for questions so i just want to say thank you so much elizabeth for the presentation it was amazing uh i learned a lot too uh thank you so much julia also for being here and representing pennsylvania volunteer organizations active in disaster and i know that we shared a lot of information elizabeth get a a great overview on disaster case management, the LTRG groups, we talked about sequence of delivery, we talked about uh, FEMA's written consent forms. Thank you so much, Alicia, for providing the FEMA's perspective on, on the services that we are able to provide. Uh, so now please uh, feel free, uh, everyone, to ask any questions uh, that you may have for anyone in this group. Hello, I was just wondering if you would be able to send the slides or the presentation to our emails. Yes, we sent that out uh, to FEMA and to Pennsylvania BOED, so. Yes, so I have, I do have the slides and uh, I will share it uh, in following the, the, the end of the presentation today. So just make sure that you have your email uh, here on the chat, just so I can make sure that you'll receive it. And I believe that this presentation is also being recorded. So hopefully we can also uh, share the recording as well. Thank you. Yeah, and my apologies for the connectivity issues. A storm is coming. I'm in Northern Virginia in the Alexander DC area. And we're starting to get some weather situation here, so. What other questions? So a lot to think about, right? And really important to have those long-term recovery groups long-term recovery committees, whatever form you want it to take, because FEMA can't cover all the costs and recovery takes a long time and communities and nonprofits rebuild communities. There was a question in the chat about long-term recovery in Pennsylvania that Flora asked, which I thought was great. Um, and can just give a quick summary of what's going on as far as I understand. Um, York County is well under their way to form a long-term recovery committee. So if you are in that area and you are not connected, I know Glenn Beard and Dennis Steffi are on, and I know there's others, I think Jeff is on as well, but if you wanna put anything in the chat, anybody from York County about how to connect there, please do. Um, and then Montgomery County is in the process of forming a long-term recovery committee. Joanna from Montgomery County Public Safety was on the call. I'm not sure if she still is, but uh, so I can say that that one's continuing, can re reach back to any of us that you got emails from and we can connect you with that as well if you're interested in Montgomery County. Um, Bucks County has a long-term recovery steering committee. And then, um, Glenn, I see your question there too. Chester has a long-term recovery committee that was standing for a long time. I don't know what the current status of that is, but um, there's, and I know that Barry, you had talked about working in Chester County. So there's some activity there towards long-term recovery. 
the other counties were kind of looking towards this outreach uh, form that we've got because as you can see, it's been difficult identifying some of the needs. So we need to do, we're, we're hoping to use that outreach form or with your help, use that outreach form to help identify where there are still needs in some of the declared counties that we haven't started long-term recovery, or even just then check that off the list that there's not a need for long-term recovery there, but want to still do our due diligence and overturning rocks. But um, we're still interested as Pennsylvania VOAD in unmet needs, even if a long-term recovery is not currently in place. So we're trying to get that, find a process for case managers to connect one way or another in Pennsylvania, hopefully through county um, level VOADs, or sorry, long-term recoveries, but if not, um, finding a way to address unmet needs otherwise. Um, but we need all your help on that, so stay tuned. And Glenn, to your question, will there be a DART specific case management training. I'm sure there will be, but uh, we just don't even have the program stood up yet. So we're still waiting to get that um, program from National VOAD in place. And once it is, then um, we will offer trainings on that. And Alan had a question. Alan, you can go to the National VOAD, National Voluntary Organizations, active in disaster in voad.org and get information on disaster case management. Uh, but it, it is a lot, I, I realize that. It has a lot of components. Any other questions? Well, I just want to thank everybody for your attendance today. I know it's tough to sit through two hours on Thursday. And this is so critical, though, for your communities. And thank you for everything you're doing for survivors. I can't tell you. I mean, I personally had was impacted by a tornado in Texas two years ago. And even though I'm in the disaster business and have been doing this for many years, I hadn't read my insurance policy, my homeowners, in like two years. And Texas changed the rules because they had so many disasters and straight line wind and hail storms. And there was a particular rider that I wasn't aware of. So guess what? A tree fell through my roof and I had to pay that out of pocket because I didn't add that additional insurance because I didn't read my policy. So one of the things, you know, I always counsel survivors on is read those insurance policies, both renters and homeowners, really critical in the recovery process. Wonderful. Thank you so much again, Elizabeth, Alicia, Julia, for all the information. We still have a few minutes left. So um, for those of you who still have any questions, uh, please feel free to stay. If you have to drop off, that's okay. And what I'm going to do is um, getting everyone's email and I'm going to share the slides, uh, the recording. I'll look into uh, also sharing the written consent form from FEMA and maybe even the disaster case management guidelines from National VOAD, just as an additional resource. Um, and again, uh, we are available to help. So please, you know, if you have any further questions, just let us know even after the presentation, feel free to email me. I can contact our FEMA team. I can contact, you know, Pennsylvania VOAD, even Liz, if she's available, just to answer some of those additional questions that might pop up as you're working with survivors as you're building long-term recovery groups. Um, and yeah, that's all I have. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.